Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Harris Picks VP Candidate Tim Walz. Quite an amazing transformation of how the Democratic Party has been uh, a mere six weeks ago, uh, particularly a day or two before the debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, after the debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and the time following until we met with yesterday's grand performance of her new VP pick, Tim Waltz. And to discuss that transformation of the Democratic Party, I'm here with my two great, great co-hosts and special esteemed guests, Chuck Crumpton and Jay Fidel. Good morning, gentlemen. We have much to discuss, and uh, Jay, I'll start with you. Uh, in my introduction, I talked about a complete transformation of the, the Democratic Party as far as how it was feeling before the debate between Trump and Biden, and where we are today. Um, what are your thoughts? How do you, how do you sum up how the Democratic Party is uh, possibly feeling in the last six weeks to today's or yesterday's performance of uh, Tim Walz? First, you have to look at what happened with, with Kamala. You know, she, she participated in this rally where 10,000 people showed up and she was brilliant, sweet, right on the money. Um, they loved her. They all, 10,000 of them loved her, and I loved her. Why? Because she was fresh. She was relating to me. She was smiling. All of that black cloud, little Abner rainstorm that Trump has been showering on us for the past X years was gone. Now, here's a real person talking to me and uh, espousing the notion that she wants to work for the country, the whole country, everyone. Uh, she wants to make life better in these United States. And that message was clear. And while she was doing it, she was doing this happy warrior thing. She's happy doing it, but she's also a warrior. And I felt when I watched her in that 10,000 people spectacular that we are in different times. Now, you ask, how has it changed the Democratic Party? Well, you know, it goes to something that we have discussed in the show many times, and that is leadership. You know, the party responds to leadership. It responds to somebody who will take them down the road, who will give them something to work for, to dream for. And that's what Kamala Harris was doing. Um, and that is what she has been doing ever since. And if you do that, you know, that kind of genuineness, that kind of leadership, the party coalesces around you, and that is what has happened. It's not that they had a big meeting somewhere, you know, and the uh, chairman of the party said, oh, we got to get together. They've been saying that for years. But in this case, you have a real leader, and people coalesce around a real leader. It's a lesson for all of us. Now, then, we get uh, Tim Walz. Now, you know, for some people were ticked off that he was not, not as popular not as credentialed as some of the other candidates. Um, but then we find out that, no, no, this is a very unusual, genuine, authentic guy from the Midwest um, with all the Midwest portfolio, all the Midwest background, all the Midwest story. And yet he's progressive. How could he get away with that? I was listening to a New York Times Daily podcast this morning, Tim, Chuck, and I urge you to take a look at it too. Um, the notion is that what distinguishes Tim Walz from the average politician is that he, he believes what he says. And his view of it is that um, he's going to take the platform of what he believes, whether it gains him votes or not. And we here in this show have often, have often you know, espoused that notion. Um, you have to be genuine. You have to be real. And that's what comes out with Tim Walz. I mean, there's lots of other things to talk about regarding Tim Walz, but that's the one thing in this podcast, in this podcast, and that, you know, that touches me and that I believe uh, Kamala Harris. This is a guy who's authentic. He's going to say what he means and mean what he says. And that conveys, it conveyed uh, to the voters of Minnesota on a number of occasions and it will convey, I believe, to the voters of the whole country. You know, I want to talk a little bit about your comments about uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, I'd like to know what, what transformation she's uh, gone through 
We all remember her, her run for presidency during the 2020 uh, Democratic you know, convention process, and they're up on stage and, you know, battling it out against Joe Biden. Um, she was effective, but she wasn't effective, and she bowed out of her candidacy quite early. Uh, we've, we're seeing a different Kamala Harris. What do you think that's attributed to? Is it just time, experience, confidence, or has she taken some training? Um, I think it's all of those things. Plus, it's the people around her who are teaching her, who give her advice and feedback, who have made her into a, a real candidate. Um, when, when it was happening on the stage back when, and I get two reactions on that. One is that she was pretty aggressive, and I didn't like that aggressiveness. She, she was not mm, of good humor, if you will, back in that, uh, that debate. And actually, when you think about it, when you go back there, take your recollection back there, what kind of a thing is it that you have all these candidates beating each other up in this debate thing, where the, the, the memorable aspects of the debate are who can beat up the other guy better? Um, and, and I feel that that's commentary on this whole in American media institution of debates. No, she didn't pr present that well as a good-humored person, um, but she has learned a lot since, and she's definitely good-humored now. As I said before, she's the happy warrior. She's mm -hmm. firm but fair. She knows what she's doing. She's got good people around her, and it shows. Okay, thank you. Hey, Chuck, um, Jay had mentioned uh, Tim Walsh and some of his uh, attributes, particularly those originating from the Midwest. I'm gonna go down a quick list. Uh, raised on a farm, grew up on a farm, um, was a high school teacher for many years, was a veteran of 24 years. He checks the, the check boxes for all the GOP in a lot of categories, gun owner, uh, a marksman, um, white, male, uh, was a house representative, state governor, and probably the most important thing, particularly in the Midwest or in the South, probably as important or more important than religion, he was a high school football coach that took a losing team uh, with no wins and it transformed them in two short years. And on the third year, they won the state uh, championship. Um, if you're if you're a non-Trump Republican, how attractive is Tim Waltz in your life as of yesterday, uh, looking as a candidate you could possibly support? I think Jay covered it really, really well. Um, hey. And I think a couple of things. I mean, one, look at the difference in the energy on the Democratic side. It's literally night and day. Look at the difference in the media coverage. Kamala is getting very favorable, very responsive, very supportive media coverage, which no Democrat has for a very, very long time. Trump is getting a fraction of the coverage he used to get. And one of the things that we see is Trump has always exhibited not just an Achilles heel. I mean, he may qualify as a heel in a much larger figurative sense. but a visible weakness and incapacity in dealing with strong, intelligent, articulate women. And Jay nailed it because Kamala has been presenting consistently as exactly that. She knows what she's doing. She knows what she's talking about. She's confident. She's clear. She's in a good mood. These are the biggest difference I see Kamala Harris and Tim Walsh are real people that people can identify with. This is a real living person. This is not a caricature. This is not a cartoon. This is not something that seeks to manipulate the press and me and everybody else. This is somebody who really is living and talking to the things that make a difference to me if I'm an ordinary American citizen, person. 
as nice a guy, as decent a guy as Joe Biden is, that he never mastered. Kamala Harris has spent the last three and a half years learning to do exactly that. And she is now doing it masterfully well. Tim Walz has been doing it for years and years and years in Minnesota. You can put him on the national stage and Jim, Jim nailed it. He is going to be exactly the same person on the national stage he has been on the Minnesota stage. And they're going to like him and they're going to listen to him and they're going to find him a respectable, honorable, believable, credible, persuasive person because he is authentic, he is genuine, and he says what he believes in and he lives what he believes in. That we have not had on the stage in leadership politics nationally for a long time. Long time. You know, I want to get your reaction to a, just an observation. And, and Jay and I have talked about the the failings of the Democratic Party as far as leadership, and most importantly, though, um, their ability to backbite and, and have a circular firing squad for so long. And, and I'm just amazed for the first time that I'm seeing a, a unification of the, of the Democrats to um, focus on uh, promoting a candidate and not second guessing who would be a better candidate. And I talk, you know, I'm talking about both Kamala Harris and Tim Walz. Uh, your thoughts about the transformation or this amazingly miracle of transforming Democrats so that they they stop fighting amongst themselves and they seem to be, appear to be, uh, unified with both candidates. Me, Chuck? Jay? Okay. Yes. No, Chuck. Yeah, and I think following Jay's lead, which I think was spot on, and the things that I just said, we see a couple of things. We see a presentation of leadership that is confident for the first time. You see Democrats now behaving for the first time in many years, like they are the dominant party. They are the leading party. They are the party that is offering real grassroots human being leadership by people who are qualified to do it, people who are believable in doing it. The irony for Trump is that he, if he's done anything in the last seven years or more, it's to identify himself with being a political demagogue. He has separated himself from normal, ordinary people in virtually every way, in his words, in his behavior. Is I was talking with somebody yesterday, one of the court clerks here, and she said something that really struck home to me. And she said, this is not a person you would even want in your home. You would not want your family and your children anywhere around someone who behaves and acts and talks like that. Look at the difference with Kamala Harris and Tim Walz. They have inspired, they have motivated, they have galvanized a party that had been struggling to find some kind of direction, some kind of identity. You say, you don't have to. We're it. Just be real people together and be united and take that where people allow us to go. That's a pretty tough offer to, to be, especially for somebody like Trump, who is the farthest thing mm -hmm. from a person that anyone could identify with. Oh, yeah, he still has backers. Does he still have the 30% or so he did have? I don't know that that's true. You're seeing a lot more cracks, a lot more chinks in the armor, a lot more defectors. 42 of his former cabinet members cast a vote of no confidence in him. Beat that. Good point. Excellent point, actually. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Jay, 
many times the VP role is that of attack dog against the other party. Uh, Kamala Harris seems to be doing a grand job on her own, but um, Tim Walsh didn't spare any comments uh, through he, either through his humorous, sarcastic remarks about the difference of growing up in a small town, uh, comparing him, his, his way of growing up versus Vance's. Uh, he certainly didn't uh, spare Donald Trump. Uh, what, how well do you think Tim Waltz is going to do as being the vice presidential attack dog in this campaign? You know, a lot of this is subjective, Tim. What I mean is uh, when I saw hmm, Kamala Harris's remarks um, on the tube, I was, I was sure she was talking to me. She was talking to me. She cares about me, and she cares that I care about others. She's interweaving a kind of social network, not only among the Democrats, but among the country. This is a remarkable, magical thing. It's as, it's as magical on her side as, as the dark magic on Trump's side, where he divides everybody. She brings us together. And the magic word is caring. What I got out of her statements is she cares. She cares about me. She cares about the country. She cares about doing the right thing. And caring is a huge message. It underlies what everything, everything that Chuck and I have been saying here today, which I agree with Chuck. Um, it's the genuineness. It's the authenticity. Uh, it's the saying what you mean and meaning what you say. But it's caring. And so immediately after I saw that, I wrote a check to her immediately. And I said to myself, you know, what is happening here that I don't write checks easily, um, not for political purposes. I mean, I get so much email every day asking me to write checks for everybody in the world. I even got a letter yesterday from Donald Trump, believe it or not. <laughs> I it believe went, it. It went straight away into the trash. Um, but what I'm saying is I wrote a check to her immediately. And I said, gee, uh, retrospectively, that, that really tells me something, that I cared enough when I heard her speak to get off my couch, to use uh, J.D. Vance's term, uh, to get off my couch and write a check. Okay. Now, I also heard uh, Tim, when he first spoke publicly, you know, before he had been selected, okay, and I said to myself, this guy is so real, he's so authentic. You know, talk about would you have him into your into your house, you know, your living room, at your kitchen table? Absolutely. I love the guy. He's so articulate, so he's brilliant, you know. You can you can be these credentials without Yale Law School, but you can also be brilliant. And he is very, very, very brilliant. And when he speaks, it reaches you. And it reached me again in the same what a what a winning team we have here. So um, I think that affects me, and if it affects me, it probably affects a lot of other people. Uh, it took me, uh, you know, out of my my bubble, if you will, and it went beyond that. And I said, these guys are the future. They're the future for me. They're the future for the people I care about. They're the future for the country, and they're the future for the country's role in the world. Um, it's that simple. The two of them are unbeatable. She made a really good choice. Well, and that goes to my question, my follow-up question. That is, um, to what degree will she be criticized by the the quiet parties? You know, the quiet the quiet folks of the Democratic Party to say uh, Shapiro would have been a better choice, Mark Kelly would have been a better choice. Uh, we haven't heard too much of that. We have. Uh, yeah. In Philadelphia, uh, Josh Shapiro spoke, and he was, uh, you know, really strong on supporting. Uh, Tim Waltz as a choice. He was strong in supporting uh, Harris. He was, uh, you know, the, the perfect guy who had not been selected, but who was going to support the selection. And he was, in my view, I think, to the people, to the world out there, he was the other leading candidate. Um, and so when he does that, he is he is really at the at the at the head of the line of all the candidates who were not selected to say yes. We agree with this. We're behind you, even even though we may, in, in our heart, we may, um, you know, be disappointed. We're not disappointed, and we're not certainly we're not we're we're not going to say anything against it. We're not going to criticize anything about anything. On the other hand, Tim, it's very clear that uh, Donald 
Jay Trump is out there with, with all his acolytes trying to figure out how to attack them, each of them, and everything the Democrats do from here on in. Uh, and he, he will be looking for material to use. I mean, for example, on, on this podcast about Tim Walz, Tim Walz was the governor of Minnesota at the time of the Floyd killing, remember? Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an issue about whether um, he waited too long to call out the, the, the National Guard. And I think I think that was a you know a not a, not a real issue anyway. And I'm sure he had good reasons for his timing about whether to call out the National Guard. But they, the reporter was saying, well, that's something that, you know, that Trump will hold against uh, Tim, um, Tim Walsh because uh, uh, Tim Walsh was criticized by some people in Minnesota at the time. Um, small stuff, small potatoes. And the question, and I put this to both of you guys, uh, is does Harris have the moxie now in her improved version, if you will? In her better communication, her smarter advisors, does she have them in her style where she says, if you want to say something to me, say it to my face, smiling, smiling all the way. Good humor. And so she's a different product right now. And the question I put to both of you is, can she maintain this popularity, a winning popularity um, in the face of attacks, continuing attacks? by Trump about everything he can figure. Uh, is he strong enough? Is she smart enough? Are her advisors smart enough? Is Walls a good companion for that? Because they are going to get pelleted by all kinds of crazy attacks. What do you guys think? Trustworthiness, consistency, reliably confident ability to stand up for what they really believe in and to make that very clear to everybody. And people are getting that and identifying with it. That's where the energy is coming from. It's coming from what generates that trust. That's my sense. Mm -hmm. So I think the point I've been making for months and months on this show is when people go into that voting booth and they have an individual choice, they don't need Jiminy Cricket to remind them. They're going to walk in there with clear, consistent, visual, palpable, personal images of people they can trust, and they will vote for them. And that's happening already. We've seen the first polls yesterday in which Kamala Harris is actually leading Trump. That's going to continue to grow because that's who they are. And that's what people are seeing. I'll take a stab at this question, Jay. And you know, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of the 2007 campaign that Barack Obama, uh, you know, initiated to become president of the United States, and the the feelings and the synergy and the energy behind his campaign. And I'm starting to see echoes of that here now with with uh, Kamala Harris and now Tim Walz. Uh, but both of those candidates, Harris and Waltz, have this, this ability, recent ability, I think. Well, not recent, but um, I think on the case of Harris, it's transformed and it's improved vastly since her uh, run at the uh, president uh, back in 2020. But what I've seen is um, one of the, 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 the stool legs of what makes a successful speech or a candidacy. And the three, the three tenets are, uh, ethos, pathos, logos, ethos, which means credibility. Logos means the logic of what you're saying. And pathos is the emotion you stir up in the audience by your, by your, your, your discussions and your, your rhetoric and, and your points you're making on stage. And what I see with Harris and Walls is this thing called ethos, the credibility of the speaker. And you said it perfectly. They're trustworthy. You just... They, they speak to me directly, and um, I'm not getting a bunch of horse pocky uh, rhetoric when they speak to me directly. And I think that's the, winning, that's the winning ingredient that both those candidates have and will certainly serve them well uh, up to the date of the election. I agree. Yeah. I agree. They, they, they speak to me that way. Um, and what I sense is, um, you know, honesty. Uh, and, and the comparison is just so huge. 
Here's Trump, which everybody in the country knows lies. He's a pathological liar. Uh, and he changes his position when it suits him. And he's transactional. You know, if he can get some money out of it, he'll, he'll change his platform um, for the transaction. And that includes transactions all over the world, like in Ukraine. Um, so th the guy had no character at all. Everything in his life is a statement of no character. Where, where these other guys now, uh, uh, Kamala Harris and uh, Tim Walz, they have character. You can see it in two minutes when they speak to you. And when you read their, um, you know, you read their, their, their speeches and, um, and when you listen to podcasts where the reporters are reporting on their lives. So um, the, the comparison is so stark. A liar, uh, a felon, um, a guy who abuses women, a guy who changes his position at will anytime it serves his interest, a guy who has all these awful acolytes around him, a guy who befriends people like Putin. You heard the remark where he congratulated Putin for the hostage exchange. That was really, really bad. Um, and it's always going to take the, the wrong position and a position that you can't trust, okay? Versus Kamala Harris, who has none of those impediments, and uh, Tim Waltz, who has none of those impediments, okay? So those are the choices. And I go to, to Chuck's statement about the voting booth. In November, everyone, uh, I hope everyone, a lot of people will be in the voting booth. And the curtain is closed. It's a private exchange between that person, that voter, and the vote, and the machine, and however the machine works. And it's a secret ballot. I suggest to you, Chuck, that your point was more right than you thought. When they go into that voting booth, even the most hardline Trumpers go into that voting booth, they're going to have a moment of hesitation. Do I want to vote for a liar and a felon? Um, or do I want to vote for somebody who touches me as a genuine person? Um, and I think a lot of them are going are gonna to jump ship. They're going to jump the Trump ship in the secrecy of that balloting process. Knock wood. You know, I was going to ask another question, but uh, your last statement tells me that those words are something we should remember, and I don't want to uh, overlay it with another question. So uh, we're out of time, almost. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity, gentlemen, to uh, give me your last thoughts and um, make it make it the best you can, because so far what you've done is excellent. Uh, Chuck, with you. The Democratic Party has tried to find someone who could present <laughs> convincingly, persuasively, <laughs> as a leader of character, conscience, and courage. But that fourth element, the one that really makes the difference, charisma. Mm -hmm. That's what Kamala Harris in the last three and a half years has developed a mastery of. She is now the most charismatic performer on the stage, presenter, speaker, person on the stage. Tim Waltz is similarly charismatic not because they're dominant, but there's a, a strong, quiet charisma there that says, we're here because you know what we believe in. We live what we believe in. And that's what we offer. And that's what we will stand up for every single time, every single moment that you entrust the leadership to us. Yeah, but you guys have short-term memory. Wasn't Donald Trump the charismatic leader? Uh, look at him now. He's diminished, uh, incredibly diminished. And I, I, I'm finding it uh, really jaw-dropping that we're uh, identifying Kamala Harris and Tim Walz as the charismatic uh, team that will most likely win the day in this election. And I, I just see it's such a transformation of where we were um, eight years ago, four years ago, and how Donald Trump was taking the world by storm. So what a transformation. Good point, Chuck. Excellent point. But look at the difference, too, and very, very quickly. Trump's charisma was limited to a very, very select, fairly extremist group who exhibited characteristics that you probably would not want to try and reflect core values. 
of this country. Paris and Walls are the opposite. They exhibit exactly the core values you would want. You want these people in your home. If somebody says, would you welcome Kamala Harris and Tim Walz into your home? In a minute, 24-7, 365. Would you introduce them and connect them to your family as people that you support? In a minute, 24-7, 365. That's the charisma we're talking about because it comes from the energy of trusting them as people. Good point. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Jay, you get the final word on this topic. We're not out of the woods on this. Uh, Trump is going to try all kinds of dirty tricks and insults and insinuations and defamation directly and, and uh, through proxies from now till November. He's going to be very aggressive about it. He's got to get back into the news cycle, right? He's out of the news cycle right now, thank goodness. Um, and the news cycle is more conscious of, of him and keeping him out, I think, I hope. Leadership requires followers. It requires people like me who get off the couch and who write a check. It requires um, discussions like this where we we try to understand what brings people together, where we we, we remember that this country is a democratic country. This country is essentially a country of immigrants, a country of liberals, a country of caring. That's what the country really is. And, and Trump has taken us away from that. And uh, I think, uh, you know, Kamala Harris and Tim Walz can bring us back to that. But it's not easy. And we have to support them. The media has to support them. Everyone has to support them. We can't lose sight of the fact that criticizing them, going into fragmentation mode, as the Democrats have done before, uh, will be very destructive. We can't let Trump get on the top. We must follow uh, Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz right down to November 5th. All right. We'll leave with that. Thank you, gentlemen, for your, as always, sage, wise comments. I'd like to thank my special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and my co-host, Jay Fidel, for an engaging conversation. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host for American Issues Take One. Join us next week, and until then, aloha.